Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm Rob's editor here, and I am thrilled to be introducing him to all of you today and that he gets to tell you a little bit about his great novel, The Warehouse. Um, this book is a fantastic thriller, but what makes it special is that it is also a powerful cautionary tale about how giant tech companies insinuate themselves into our society and our lives and how the, uh, the conveniences and ease they provide are allowing them to steal the American dream from us in plain sight. Uh, for me, it is speculative fiction at its very best. It's, it's a book that uses the tools of the genre to take a hard look at where we are today and where we're headed in the very near future. Um, in addition to The Warehouse, Rob is the author of the Ash McKenna crime series and the short story collection Takeout. He also co-wrote Scott Free with James Patterson. Uh, he's worked as a political reporter, communications director for, for a politician, and a commissioner for the city of New York. And he is currently publisher at MysteriousPress.com. He lives in Staten Island with his wife and his daughter. Uh, he is also an avid practitioner of Krav Maga, so don't, don't mess with him. <laughs> uh, please join me in welcoming Rob. Thank you, Julian. And uh, so I want to I wanna start uh, first by, by thanking all of you. Uh, and, and it's for two big reasons. One is because when I was a kid, uh, we will be polite and we'll say that I was rambunctious. <laughs> And my mom was always looking for an outlet for me, like something that would sort of distract me and, and give me, like, tire me out a little bit. And she signed me up for a writing program at my local library, uh, the New Brighton branch on Staten Island on Castleton Avenue. And I would go once a week uh, with my little marble notebook, and they would give us like a writing prompt. And we would have to write a story on it. I think I was like eight or nine years old. And it was the first time I ever thought, you know, yeah, maybe I can do this. Like, this is kind of cool. And, and it was something that I really got into and I really loved, and, and it, was a, it was a good time for me to have that. Uh, years later, I would become a communications director for the city councilman who ran the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee, and then later the Finance Committee. And in doing that job, I really learned what libraries do. It, it's not about giving people books. You, you're, you're a community resource center, uh, which I think kind of goes over a lot of people's heads. And so we always tried really hard to fight for money in the budget. I'm sure the New York City libraries here will say that they always wish they got a little bit more in the budget, uh, but we always did our best. And so I want to thank you first for what you do for your communities, but also what you do for kids like me. Because, I mean, really, those rambunctious kids who are running around your libraries right now could very well be standing up here at some point, and that's, that's pretty special. So I want to tell you a little bit about the book. Uh, it's, it's my seventh book. It is, it is the first book I ever wrote about something that made me angry, which is about how corporations basically treat their employees like a disposable product. You know, like we are the food that they eat to grow bigger. And I, I could sit here and I can give you a ton of examples about, you know, like chicken factory workers who have to wear diapers because they aren't allowed bathroom breaks, or how the gig economy with like Uber and Lyft are basically designed to strip benefits away from people. But I want to tell you about Maria Fernandez. Uh, I never met Maria, but I dedicated the book to her. Uh, Maria worked for three Dunkin' Donuts in New Jersey. None of them would hire her full time. She was part time at all of them, presumably because they didn't want to confer benefits. And she would sleep in her car between shifts. And in 2014, uh, she was sleeping in her car and a gas can overturned and she died. And it was this really horrifically tragic story, not just because it happens, but because she was struggling to pay $550 a month on a basement apartment in Newark. And that same year, the CEO of Drunk Duncan Brands made $10.2 million, which no one needs $10 million. I know that no one in this room would say no to a check for $10 million, <laughs> uh, nor would I. But you know, there's such a thing as too much money. It's like, what does this guy want? Does he want like a 10th BMW or like a fifth yacht? You know, and meanwhile, Maria can't, she, she, she can barely support herself. And, and there's this humongous gulf uh, between, between the wealthy and, and the working class that really seems to be getting worse. You know, it's, it's, it's this problem that has, has uh, I, I grew up with it because my, my family was, was working class and they struggled very hard to provide for us. And it's just, you know, I wanted to write a book about that. 
uh, because you know I can sit here with data points and with examples and with graphs and all this stuff, and, and by the end, you might be a little upset, but you'd also probably be bored to tears. Uh, whereas if I write a book about it, you know, stories sit with us so much different uh, than emotion. Uh, stories sit with us differently than data because stories are about emotion and they're about empathy. They're about sort of either feeling like you have been in that position or that you could be in that position. And so the warehouse sort of assumes that, you know, one company, uh, I won't say which company, kind of takes over the entirety of the retail economy and starts, uh, yeah, and starts uh, live-work facilities, which are actually uh, really prevalent in Asia right now, a company called Foxconn that makes like iPhones and stuff. And you live there in addition to working there and the, the conditions are terrible, you know, they're, they, and they pay you less and they expect you to work more because you live there. So it's like, oh, well, you already live here, you don't have to commute, why not work 12 hours a day? And so it imagines sort of bringing that over uh, to America, which Foxconn is scouting locations in Wisconsin, so it could happen. And it follows three characters, the CEO of the company, uh, Gibson, who is dying, and this is like a seismic shift in the American economy. And then two workers, uh, Paxton and Zinnia, who are both sort of trying to eke out a living. Uh, Paxton had his career derailed by this company and now has to work for them. Zinnia, Z Zinnia's story is a little bit more interesting, and I'll let you get to that in the book. But, uh, you know, I, I've always really, really loved fiction that sort of speaks to a problem. You know, it's why books like Fahrenheit 451 and 1984 and Handmaid's Tale are, are so incredible, and, and they stick with us so much. Because, again, they, they let that emotion sit with us in a way that we sort of understand how this could affect us. Uh, and, and, and to be very clear, I'm not putting myself in the same class as, you know, Bradbury and Orwell and Atwood. Uh, they are incredible writers and they are my inspirations. Uh, this was just sort of my attempt to try to get there. Uh, and and I, wanted to, I wanted to take these things and sort of wrap them in the language of a thriller. Uh, and, and the way I like to compare that is uh, when my daughter doesn't want to eat her broccoli, I stick it in her mac and cheese, and then we both win because she gets a meal that she likes and she gets her vitamins. So, so this was a little bit like that. I wanted to write something that was sort of, you know, fun and, and had, a lot of, had, a, had a lot of action and, and really moved forward in a propulsive way. But also, by the end of it, you kind of felt bad about everything. So um, <laughs> it, is a, uh, it, it is really exciting. This is the first time I've gotten the chance to speak to a crowd about the book. Uh, so this is really awesome. And I'm really excited for you all to read it. So thank you so much. Thank you.